Okay, let's take our Bibles again this morning and turn to 1 Peter. And we do have our Lord's table this morning, so we will be uh, turning to that at the end of my message. We're in a section of 1 Peter that now starts discussing uh, more in detail the practice of holiness, how we're actually to think about it, and then how it's ultimately to be lived out in the world, in society, and what God expects of us. So that's where we're heading in uh, this chapter. Of course, I'll not get there to that particular place this morning And so we're looking at the destiny of the Christian, which is understanding salvation and then learning how to practice our salvation in our daily lives. So let's pray. Lord, this morning, as we again put our eyes upon the text of Scripture, and I pray, Lord, that's where our eyes would be and our mind would be as we now consider in our own lives, what it means to grasp the practice of holiness and how our lives have drastically changed when we came to Christ. Now, we didn't know all that in the beginning, and some of those things are spiritual changes. So I I pray, Lord, you would give us a sense on those changes in our life so we can now live the way we ought to, and behave the way we ought to, knowing that we are in Christ Jesus, and in Christ Jesus we are a new creation, and all things are becoming new. And so I pray, Lord, that that would become a reality in our life, that we would understand the Word of God for ourselves, and then put our place in the equation of Scripture so we can understand it in light of what the Spirit of God is teaching us. Thank you, Lord, again for this day and your word. In Christ I pray, amen. So this morning we'll be looking at verses 6 through 10, and let me read that, verse 6 through 10. I'll revert from verse 4, from where we were last time. And coming to him, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and coming to him as a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders reject is this stone became the very cornerstone, and the stone a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumbled because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. But you as a choice, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You that you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy." So in this section, again, it's preparing believers and equipping them to live in this world and even to live in the suffering and the hostilities that the world will actually throw at you. So, so far, you should have been grasping in 1 Peter that since the Lord begot you, you are children that must be holy. And since he is our judge and has ransomed you with so great a price that his children are to live 
before him in reverential fear. And since you are born again with corruptible seed of the word of God, that our relationships with one another should be that of sacrificial love because we are children of one father and we have now an eternal thing going on inside of us that will last forever. We have eternal life. And since you have been begotten by means of the eternal word of God, you should long for the milk of the word of God as your true and proper nourishment for every day. So in our passage, uh, this Lord's Day, and of course continuing on from last week, we find that the, the Christian is now meeting together in the church as a gathered people, and that it constitutes a temple, and a temple, of course, is where God actually dwells. And we saw that where uh, the temple of God is, uh, it's, it's where the temple of God is, and where God communicates with his people through the eternal, enduring word of God, and then also uh, when God receives gifts and sacrifices and worship and prayers from his people, it happens now in this new church, this new community that God is bringing us together. So together, Christians are living stones in the same building where we are royal priests serving the same temple, worshiping the same God in the same family and belonging ultimately to the same community. So of course, the imagery is coming from the Old Testament a picture or a metaphor of God building the church into a temple, the church being built as a new temple of living stones upon the cornerstone, Christ himself. And so when we're looking at the practice of holiness, we saw last time that uh, together Christians are living stones assembled into a spiritual house They are to approach God, of course, in a certain way, where in Hebrews it tells us to let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because of Jesus Christ, we can go right to God. The only burnt offering I mentioned last week that atones eternally for sin is made was made by Christ himself, and true worshipers no longer have to bring their lambs to the altar to receive forgiveness of sins, but instead they bring a sacrifice involved with praising God for his grace and declaring one's attention uh, to love God and to keep his commandments. So now that animal sacrifice is obsolete. Praise and good works by themselves constitute the proper sacrifices expected of a Christian. And of course, that also means that approaching Christ, we approach him now as a living stone. And that stone in Scripture, verse number four, he is uh, choice and precious Uh, in the sight of the Father, and should also be in our sight that Christ is not a dead idol. Uh, He is not a lifeless monument. He is not a dead principle. He is the living, resurrected, life-giving one. So Jesus is the one who gives life to all those who come to him believing in his death and resurrection. But not all who encounter Jesus, not all who hear the message of Jesus come to the same conclusion. Some examine Jesus and they deem him useless, uh, like the apostate religious leadership of Israel. It says, of course, that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. So now we approach the living stone, Jesus Christ, and assemble in the church to worship him. And so we are actually called in the church uh, priests, that all believers are priests. And the picture being drawn in verse number five, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, 
Of course, it's drawn uh, from God building his church into a temple, and the purpose of a temple was for the work of the priests. But here, the Bible is telling us again that all believers are priests. Once they become born again, they become priests, and they a priest has, is someone who has access to God, even more so than any of the Old Testament priests had, and only the high priest could enter the holiest place in the temple and only one time of the year, as it says in Hebrews, that we, uh, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, and how do we do that? By the blood of Jesus, by the veil of his flesh. When that veil was rent in two, when Jesus died in our place, his flesh being like the veil was rent for us, so what? So we can have complete access to God. And so we are a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. And what are the priests to do? Well, the priests are to, as it says in our passage in verse number five, they are to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. And of course, that means that those sacrifices are very clear that we are to give ourselves. Uh, this is our, our spiritual sacrifices. We are to present our bodies as a living and a holy sacrifice, which is acceptable to God. That's our spiritual service of worship. And of course, while we're doing that, we're making sure that we're not conformed to the world, but we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind so we would know what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. And then we are to worship God by our words, by praising and thanking him for what he has done in our life. And that, that praise and thanks goes on continually in our life, every day of our life. And then, of course, our works and service to him that of doing good, stepping into the place in which we are serving God and doing good and offering up and sharing and offering up sacrifices to please God. And that brings me to our passage this morning in verse number six, that is this, that we are coming together as Christians to share uh, together, actually, Christians share God's understanding of Christ. Now, that can mean two things, that Christ is either an honored cornerstone or something else. He can be also an obstacle to stumble over, and he can't be anything else but those two things. And that's what the scripture is really pointing us to this morning, is that, but Christians, they come to an understanding because of the word of God, that they are understanding who Christ really is. And for us, who is Christ? Well, in our passage this morning, we see that Christ is an honored cornerstone to those who believe. So Christians believe that Jesus of, is of supreme value. Now look at verse number six. It says, for this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Now, this is verse number seven. This precious value then is for you who believe. So this is given to those, to us, who believe. And what do we believe? We believe, of course, that he is of supreme value, that he is the cornerstone that binds all the walls in the spiritual temp temple firmly together, and without Jesus Christ, everything, and I mean everything, crumbles. So Christians give honor to the cornerstone, 
In other words, the honor of Christ is recognizable to you. That at one time in your life, Christ was not choice or precious. He was not of high value. But now that you've come to know him, he is of an extremely he is at a, an extremely extreme level of high value and that he is choice in the sense that there's no one else that can take his place. See, Jesus, to us who believe, he is precious as being costly and expensive. And according to our text, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Now, if you didn't notice that actually uh, Peter is quoting from Isaiah in this passage, chapter 28, verse 16, and he is saying something in a little different way, but in the same way as in our text here. But I, I, I would like to say that there are many disappointments that you and I will face in this life. In fact, you probably have gone through some already, and you will probably go through more. But I will guarantee this, believing in Christ will not be one of them. Believing in Christ, you will never be disappointed in him. Now, you may sense some disappointment, it's only because you don't know the word. But once the word of God clears things up, there's no ground at all for us to be disappointed. In fact, again, here's what it says in, I don't know why this is going so fast today. Um, I can't even hold it, so I don't know. Anyway, let's take our Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. And look what it says there. Now, this is a reference, of course, from the prophet Isaiah. And it says in Isaiah this. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly stone, cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed, and notice what it says, he who believes in it will not be disturbed. Now, Peter uses disappointed, Isaiah uses disturbed, and I think that both of them, of course, mean the same thing, because Isaiah is using in the sense of this stone being such an important part of the building that if it was disturbed, it would all come crumbling down. But because it's never going to be disturbed, that means it's fixed, it's firm, it's forever. So, in other words, there will be no adverse influence towards believers. Peter uses the word disappointment. What do I mean? There will be no shame. There will be no disgrace for the believer. There will be no disappointment. There will be no embarrassment. There will be no rejection. There will be no dishonor. And of course, this is before God, that none of those things would happen. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a real good place to be. When you know that because of what Christ accomplished in your behalf, that your salvation produces for you nothing but joy and stability, something no one could take away, Some, something nobody, no demon can move, that this relationship I have with Christ is going to be one that has no disappointments in it at all whatsoever. 
that you know God's way of salvation, his design for salvation will only bring joy to you. But on the other hand, it will bring judgment to others. And the, the, the thing that we need to grasp is that there's really no in-between. It's either one or the other. Either I have joy or I am still under God's justice, right? And God is a just God, and he will have his justice fulfilled one way or the other because, because of who he is. Now, if you notice the word in here, I highlighted it, Zion. Don't let that word throw you off because this word has a rich history in Scripture. But the word, really, the, the word means the temple area as a dwelling place of God. In fact, in Isaiah here, uh, this is where God lays the foundation of the glorified heavenly city. And many theological ideas are attached to this word Zion or, or the Zion theme. But the dominant idea of Zion is, is as a place of uh, a dwelling place of God a place where God is in the midst of his people and is joined to a larger theme that we pick up in the New Testament where when the Word of God talks about Emmanuel, God in our midst. So the bottom line is that we are talking about, when we're talking about Zion, that God is with his people, that he is in the midst of his people. And where is that? In the temple. And what's the temple? The church, where you and I meet together and each of us has the permanent indwelling of the Spirit of God. So in that gathered assembly, that is where God dwells, and we dwell with him. And as we dwell with him, we learn more about him, and as we learn more about him, our understanding of Christ becomes that of a choice cornerstone in a building that can never be destroyed. And precious, more precious than anything else I'll ever receive in all of eternity, and that falls with Christ. And it's for those who believe. See, that's yours. That's, that's a gift to you. And if you think of that, then you only could come to this conclusion that God desires for his people joy and peace. That's what he desires for us. However, looking back at our passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, for those who disbelieve Christ and, and find him useless, I want to say this, Christ does not go away because someone doesn't believe him. You can't avoid Christ. You cannot ignore Christ. You cannot reinterpret Christ. You cannot go around Christ. Christ is an unavoidable obstacle to every human being. That's what we're looking at here in Scripture. That if anyone tries to follow any other path to heaven... Jesus Christ instead will be a large, immovable stone lying in their path in which they must deal with. Either Christ, I said, is going to be a choice, precious cornerstone, or Christ is going to be an obstruction to you, a hindrance to you. In verse number 7, it says this, this precious this precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, look what it says, for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Peter doubles up his point here in this passage so you don't miss it. And he is saying, listen, 
This cornerstone anchors the building, and from it, all lines and measurements radiate. The cornerstone is the keystone of the building. If this cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ, is rejected, or one turns their back on him, there is nothing left but ruin. There is nothing left but destruction. Now, look what it says in verse number 8. It says it's a stone of stumbling. Now, this stone of stumbling indicates an obstacle against which a person can strike his foot and cause injury. Of course, this word is used to refer to various uh, purposes a stone may have in any building project, but here it's one of tripping over. And then it says a rock of offense. The phrase rock of offense suggests a trap set to trip up someone. See, Christ, instead of being a clear way of salvation to the Jews and to the unbelieving, Christ becomes a scandal. For the word offense is really the word scandalon in the Greek. In other words, he becomes a snare, a cause of ruin, an occasion of falling over him instead of coming to him and believing in him. Of course, this is specifically directed at the Jews, but it also is the same for all unbelievers, all those who would reject him. So if we put all these terms together, it expresses in the strongest way the seriousness of ignoring and forgetting and rejecting Christ. In the end, if someone does that, God abandons such people to the error of their own ways, to the emptiness of their systems of belief, which really is a system of unbelief. And so that is the seriousness of Christ, that he is either going to be one or the other, one of producing joy and salvation and one of producing stumbling, rejection, ruin, and judgment. That's what the Word of God is teaching us. But there is another thing that I want you to see in our text, and that's found in verse number 8. And it says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. Disobedient to the word of God. That's why they stumble. And in other words, stumbling at the word is the penalty for not believing it. What's the inevitable consequences of rejecting Christ? Well, it's just believing a lie. That's the other side. Any lie. Any lie that concludes like this. There are many ways to get to God besides Christ. Have you not heard that today? There's no hell because God is a God of love. My God wouldn't have a place like that. I've been a good person, so I'll be okay. Nobody really knows the right way, so I'm not alone. I'll take my chances with the man upstairs. See, Satan is a liar. And he will lie to you to say that you're too young to believe. You have plenty of time. 
And then when you get old, he says, you're too old and crotchety to believe. You're settled and comfortable in the way you've been living. So what's the point? And if those lies don't work on you, then he'll come up with one just for you. Just for any person who is and wants to remain in unbelief or in their own way of saving themselves. Spiritually dead people are characterized in Scripture by unbelief and rebellion. There's an active rebellion and there's also a passive rebellion. It doesn't matter what kind of rebellion it is. It's still rebellion to reject Christ. In fact, the high ruling body of Israel did not recognize that God was at work in Jesus in a new way inaugurating God's sovereign reign in the lives of those who would respond in faith and repentance. They assumed that they had figured out Jesus. That's what happens when you're reading the gospel. You have a bunch of people thinking, I think I got a handle on this guy. And what happens is that they got Jesus wrong. They assumed, they figured him out, however, the source of their conclusion was fleshly, worldly, and demonic. And why did they get Jesus wrong? Well, because of the greatest wickedness that exists among humanity. And what is that? It's this. It's the sin of unbelief. Isn't it this Isn't this really the sad commentary and repeated so often today that people hear the message on how God provides deliverance through Christ Jesus and they dismiss it and set it aside as if it doesn't really matter or apply to them? That's for someone else. That's not for me. And what they are really doing is really expressing their unbelief, expressing their deadness to spiritual things, expressing their deadness to understand anything at all about God and his way of saving people. It was Grant Osborne who said this, no one should dare assume to be able to reject Christ repeatedly with impunity. There are consequences and they are eternal. So Peter wants us to understand this in Scripture, that there are not many ways. There is just one way, God's way. In fact, also in the Word of God, the Bible, in the Gospel of Mark, when I was preaching through Mark, the same subject was addressed by Jesus, and Jesus pressed upon the Jewish leadership their ignorance of Scripture. And in fact, this is what he says to them. Have you not read the Scripture? Now, now just get the context of what Jesus just said there. He's saying it to the, to the leaders and teachers of theology in Israel. And he's saying to them, have not you not even read the Bible? It's, it's always been there. Did you miss that? And then what did he say to them? The stone which the builders rejected. This became the chief cornerstone. He's saying the same thing to them as he is saying to us. See, the the problem has been that they have not been reading the Scripture. And the problem is that they have not been listening to God's spokesman the prophets in the Old Testament. And you know what? It's the same problem today. The only reason why I can tell you these things this morning is because I have read the Scriptures, but I don't know all the Scriptures. And the reason why people conclude what they do is because they have not read the Scriptures and have not understood them and have not listened to those who do know the Scriptures and are attempting to preach it 
to them so they do not have to spend eternity separated from God. Historically, this particular psalm was composed to express the joy of the people after the Babylonian captivity, either on the occasion of laying the cornerstone of their new temple or on the occasion of the dedication of the completed temple or structure. But it says in Scripture, the builders rejected. And the word rejected means to reject after scrutiny, to reject after full examination. And then once you examined it, you conclude that this particular stone is useless. It's unfit for this particular building. Let's throw it out and get one that we think should fit. So they're talking about Christ here. And that's exactly what people do with Christ. They look at him, they hear about him through their life, and they conclude completely in another direction what the Bible says about him. See, the point that you have to really make with people is, do you believe what the Bible says about Jesus? Not what you think it says, not what you heard somebody say about him, but what does the Bible actually say about him? See, Jesus Christ is a God who's full of loving passion, compassion, and and wants to extend his mercy to people. But he is also a God of justice and judgment. And if that mercy is shunned, if it's rejected, if it's laid aside, there's no other place for a person to uh, settle is then under God's wrath where they've been the whole time. See, Jesus himself is the rejected stone and now becomes in God's good purpose the chief cornerstone of the building that is the new temple, that is the Christian church, that the chief cornerstone which binds together again the two sides of the building and so becomes architecturally the most important stone in the structure The cornerstone then governs every angle in the formation of the building itself. And that all the godly who see this strange way of God's working can only bow their heads in awe and reverence at God's plan and say, wow, I would have never done it like that. But Lord, if this is the way you've done it, I want to submit to it. So those who do not believe actually have examined the stone, Christ, and have determined there is no value in him. So both believers and unbelievers examine the stone but come to different conclusions and come to different outcomes. See, Christ is the only way of salvation. He cannot be avoided So then that person who rejects him, for whatever reason, that person remains in a state of ruin and destruction. And you cannot whatsoever change that. The only thing that could change that is if that person comes to Christ. If that person comes and believes. Now, if you didn't get what said at the end of verse number 8, I want you to look there again. Notice what it says. It says, verse 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and then, look what it says, and to this doom they were also appointed. Wow. That's a pretty heavy statement. Now, in my evaluation, some people might say, well, that's teaching double predestination that God predestines people to heaven and to hell. I don't believe the Bible teaches double predestination. I believe what it's saying here, it's stating the consequences of rejecting Christ, God's appointed stone. That's what it's doing here. God punishes those who reject Christ. 
those Jews who have rejected God's corners, chief cornerstone will have no mercy in the end. Anyone who does not receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will have no mercy. And what's God's mercy? God's mercy is not giving you what you deserve. If God withholds his mercy, he gives you what you deserve. And what do you deserve? Because you're, you're a sinner, because I'm a sinner. Without Christ, I deserve God's judgment. God must judge me based on my sin, and it's separating me from him. And so, therefore, God's justice comes down on all those who have not believed. So anyone who does not receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will have no mercy. One translated translation put it like this. They will stumble because... They will not listen to God's word nor obey it. So this punishment will follow. They will fall. They will fall. God's mercy is only to be had when one believes wholeheartedly in Jesus Christ. But see, Peter's going to go on to say, but that's not you. You believed So let's move from this heavy message to now who you're supposed to be. And so I'm going to pick this up next time, but I do want to say this. If you have believed in Christ today, you are accepted in the beloved. You have new life that brings also new identity. You are not the person you used to be. So, who are you then? If I were to ask you this morning, who are you? What would you say? I come up to you and say, well, hey, who are you? You would say, I'm an American. I'm, uh, I live on the East Coast. I'm a Christian. I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm an elder. I'm a deacon. I'm a husband. I'm a wife. I'm a teacher. I'm a computer programmer, an IT person. I crunch numbers all day. I'm a pilot. I'm retired. I'm an office manager. I'm an officer of the law. I'm a truck driver, a scientist, a medical doctor, a nurse. I'm a child and elder caretaker. I'm a counselor. I'm a home manager, a nanny. I'm a mechanic. I'm a construction worker. I'm a secretary, a beautician, a barber, an engineer. I'm a landlord. I'm a photographer. See, that's probably what you would say. And there's many other things that could be included in the answer. But I doubt very much if in the answer to that question, you would have said this to me, I'm a saint. You wouldn't have said that. Why, why is it you wouldn't have said that? Well, some have never been taught differently from the Word of God. Others think it would be prideful to identify themselves as saints, maybe because we are saints who sin and think of ourselves more saved sinners than saints. Being a saint who is alive and free in Christ does not mean spiritual maturity or sinlessness, but it does provide the basis for hope and future growth as a believer. See, according to Scripture, a matter of fact, a believer in Christ is a saint. Right? You are a saint. And so... What Peter's going to do is he's going to start telling us this. This is who you are. Stop looking at yourself the way you think you are and start looking at yourself the way you actually are. In other words, the way God now sees you in Christ. That's how the... See, that changes everything about us because we have a a lot of problem today with self-identity. We have a lot of problem today with 
we call self-esteem, right? Don't we have a lot of problem with that? And people run to all kinds of places because, because they don't know what to do with who they are. But when you come to Christian, when you come to the Word of God, you're going to find this. This is who you were, and now this is who you are. And when you see yourself like that, everything changes. Your whole mindset changes. And who are you? And I'm not going to preach on the rest of this this morning. I'm going to end right here. Look what it says in verse number 9. But you are. You see that? Can you include yourself in you are? In verse number 9? But you are. What are you? A chosen race? A royal priesthood? A holy nation? A people for God's own possession? For what reason am I to understand myself like that? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. See, that's who you are. Have you been looking at yourself like that? I don't think so. But we need to, right? Because when we do, this is how God sees us. And when we do, how we see ourselves will change our behavior. It will change the way we live because it changes the way we think of ourselves based on how God sees us. All right, next time we're going to look at that. Let's pray. Lord, this morning I do again appreciate the word of God. And I, Lord, I, I feel like I shouldn't end there. But Lord, the Lord's table is before us. And I pray, Lord, as we think of the Lord's table this morning that we would consider the very important things you, you tell us in the word of God can, concerning it. That is something that you want us to be part, partaking of on a regular basis because it's the core of the gospel the bread representing your body, that you came into this world as a man. You lived a sinless life. You became the perfect lamb of God, like no other man. And Lord, you died in the place of sinners. And then you shed your blood to wash away that sin that separates us from who you are. Your very, very, your very presence. And so, Lord, this morning, as we come to this time, it would be a time that we really would reflect on those things. And I pray in Christ's name, amen.